Okay. Um, and what I would like to talk this morning is to give you a few idea of what, why the speech technology are as they are today, and try to describe a little bit text to speech, ASR, and also speaker verification and identification. Only little bits, otherwise it will take ages, hours and hours. Then I will talk a bit of the platform and the standards that is what I'm doing since 2001 and what Raman said before. I will conclude with giving you my opinion about what's going on and what can be the next uh, step of the technology and of the platforms. Obviously, um, you're free to interrupt me and to ask questions in any moment if we can do something interactive is better. My presentation is a bit long, so we will jump from one place to the other, also depending on the time. We have one hour time, Raman? Okay. Few words about Loquendo, if you don't know Loquendo. Loquendo is an Italian company. Was born in 2001. When Google was born? In which year? 99. 99, so we are a little younger than Google. But behind us, there were 30 years or so of experience because actually we are a spin-off of Te Telecom Italia Research Lab. So there are people that is alive that they are working on ASR and TTS. We are 90 people and uh, we are still owned by Telecom Italia even if we are uh, a company. We are one of the leader companies in speech technologies, certainly the European leader and our headquarters is in Turin. Raman have been there, so if you want to come in Turin, I will be very happy to invite you to visit our company and also to eat chocolate, drink wines, and so on, all the things that you can do in Turin. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. For the people like me, and also Roberto Pieraccini, if you know that is now in, was in IBM before in AT&T, and now is in a small company called Speed Cycle. The people that studied in the 80s, the goal was to do a machine like HAL 9000. Uh, but after many years, the goal are reduced. Now, as Roberto is saying in his blog, would be nice to have the speech technologies like the ATM machine. That they do an, an easy task, they do it cleanly, simple to use, and that's it. Not to have a very, very high goal, even if it's interesting to continue to have high goals. But what is important today is start to use those technology in all the place where they can perform like the ATM. A bit, a bit of history. The history of speech technology is very long. It starts at least in the 18th century, at the end of the 18th century. If we look at the TTS only, this is the arrow designed by Klatt in the mid 80s. Um, before the 18th century, the idea was to have talking heads and there were in the Middle Ages in other period, but in the enlightening period, they tried to study and to create something. For instance, Kratzenstein constructs some resonators that were able to pronounce the, the vowels. But the first that tried to create a machine was von Kempelen that did the box that is over, over there. And that using two hands, in those small picture is easier to see. On one hand, you pump the hair. On the other hand, you are stretching this ribbon thing here in order to distort it and create different shapes. And with the finger, you can press those in order to make the sound. This was a really talking machine, they reconstructed it, and you can listen how it was speaking. S -var. This is the machine speaking. I go. So this was the best in the 18th century. Then in the 19th, 
more or less the model remained the same. We arrived to the early 20th century and the electrical analog was discovered and started to be used. Maybe the most famous is water that was presented in 1939. There are 10 filter circuits in the motor and combined with the two energy sources, they give a total of 20 separate components to be used in building up speech sounds. But now let's have Mr. Garrett and Miss Harper actually show us what the voter can do with these 20 separate sounds. Well, we've heard the voter make a word, and by combining words, of course, we get a sentence. For example, Helen, will you have the voter say, she saw me? She saw me. That sounded awfully flat. How about a little expression? Say the sentence in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Well, did she see? So as you have listened, there was a certain degree of flexibility, even if the voice was not very pleasant. And there was a person at the typewriter that was moving some keys in order to control the machine. Then the 50 and we arrive more close. This is the IBM thinking. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. 1965. Um, I put in the presentation many, many other links. If you want, you can try them. Well, the best that was obtained in the 80s was something like this. 35, several of the deck talk voices. I am Perfect Paul, the standard male voice. I am Beautiful Betty, the standard female voice. So this is Some the people voice. think I sound a bit like a man. I am Huge Harry, a very large person with a deep voice. I can serve as an authority figure. These were the deck talk voices, the best obtained in the 80s, 1986, 87. And they are still more or less like this. Those are four month base. We will briefly see how they are done. One interesting uh, feature of those kind of TTS was they can speak very, very fast. And I think Raman is using a four month TTS. Are you? Yeah. 36. Deck talk speaking at about 300 words per minute. The following is a list of topics in today's news. In the sports world, the Red Sox lost to Detroit. First round matches were played in the Wimbledon tennis tournament. I'm okay. Um, if you want to listen to all the examples, you need to click to this link. I just seen that now they are restored. This, this was a kind of historical project. And so I put the question, how is it possible to save this? It was very interesting because they made a little bit the history of all the research lab, the people that work it before everything is swept because the people are died and you lose everything. I have two or three colleagues in Loquendo that are close to retire. It would be very interesting to interview them and put in a place their story because it remains. And in that project, there are also the audio of all those different variation of uh, TTS. <clears throat> if we look more in general, the field of speech and language, we see that in the same period, different paradigms were fighting. At the beginning, were symbolic against stochastic, so symbolic. Uh, they were derived from artificial intelligence technique, the stochastic from statistical. And in the 70s and the 80s, there were at least four different fields that were not talking each other. So all of them were doing research projects, but without any correlation. Uh, at the, in the 80s and the 90s, those fields tried to mix together, and now they are borrowing techniques one from each other in order to improve the results. Certainly, in the speech technology, the statistical corpus-based um, um, formalisms were the one that gave the better result and are the ones that are used today. <clears throat> this is a bit from Italy, but we can skip that. Okay, I will talk a little bit of the speech technologies today. Um, I mean, what you can extract from an acoustic signal that are obviously the word and also the meaning, if you can grasp the meaning from the recognized word. 
But you can derive many other features, for instance, the language, the gender, and also is very interesting today, emotional state of the person that is speaking. Because they might be useful to adapt the interaction to the speaker, uh, or for instance, the language, to select the right language to speak to that person. And on the other side, uh, for the TTS, from a meaning, you need to obtain a text. And from the text, the text-to-speech should be able to read any kind of text. It's a reading machine that should be able to do like a human, read everything, even if it's not easy. I will start with the TTS, just a few things. If we, there is a sagittal uh, of a person, uh, the vocal tract uh, include the vocal cords that are, that are emitting the sounds, and then two main resonant cavity. One is the mouth, and the other one is the nose. And the velum is closing the uh, nasal cavity uh, when is not needed. So the glottis is doing something like this. It's a kind of uh, uh, impulse signal. And all is done on the resonation that is done in those chambers. And the result of that is at the end to obtain this for the voiced sound. For the unvoiced sound, is a bit different. But this is more or less what the, uh, the, the person is doing. The synthesizer, there are at least three big families. One is the articulatory synthesizer. Here, the idea is to study how the human is working. So to understand how all the muscles and what are the parameters that are in place and try to use them in order to reproduce the voice. The formal synthesizer had a similar idea, but they don't care of what the human is doing. They care of the result. They're, they are trying to reproduce only the result when the, the, the person is speaking. Those two families are called parametric because the idea is that there are a set of parameters and rules that change them in order to realize the text-to-speech. But the third family that at the time of CLAT in the middle of the 85, 87 was a little bit stupid technique. That is a copy technique that is concatenative. That means I have sounds. I know that I need to put some in close to the other. So I need to copy them one close to the other and then to do some smoothing. And I obtain the TTS. This was the idea behind the diphone based. And in the 90, there were only diphone based because there were computational. You cannot have a very big corpus for the TTS. Uh, but at the end of the 90s, the unit selection was discovered. Loquendo was one of the first to do that. The idea was very simple, was if I'm connecting small units, the diphony is the transition between one phoneme and the other. So you are connecting the diphone transition from one phoneme to the other, and then you add other parameters. In the unit selection, the idea, why not to search in a database, search the best match of segment, and then connect those larger segments. The result was a very, very natural <laughs> sounding voice I will show you. This is what we did. This is Italian. That was the best done in the 80s. Now in the 90s. Mi chiamo Mario e sono la voce robotica di Loquendo. Scrivi una frase. Io la leggerò con voce innaturale. It says, write a sentence, I will uh, speak in an unnatural way. Well, this was very comprehensible. All the tests done on intelligibility were fine. So if you have a voice speaking like that, you can understand everything. But was unpleasant. So the unit selection is doing this. Buongiorno a tutti. Señoras y señores, buenos días. Hello, everybody. Bonjour y bienvenue. Guten so, Tag. You, you see that the Dies ist ein Beispiel von synthetisierter Sprache. Ich bin die deutsche Stimme von Loquendo TTS. You see that the naturalness is completely different. And actually, it's the same technique of those three 
and a different ETS. So the third generation can degrade to the second one if you need to say something that is very weird and you cannot find longer segments. So it's exactly the same technique. But if you find a better match, you gain in a very natural, uh, natural voice. Yeah. OK, the question is how the unique selection is working. Um, I explain you going ahead. I, I will explain you now. Because if you look inside the TTS, there are two modules. The first one is natural language processing. You take a text. You need to identify the words. From the words, you need to know how to pronounce the word. But you have more, because you need to give an intonation. You need to give something more. So this is done exactly in Diphon and Unix selection. The end of the natural language is a sequence of phonemes and other parameters that say how long it needs to be spoken, uh, pitch, and so on. This is the result. The Unix selection is in the second part. Using those phonemes, you are assessing a big database of recorded voice that is labeled with the phoneme and all the other parameter. So if you want to pronounce something, you find the best match in the database of the segments that can be good match of pieces of the sentence. So you can have an entire word, but also a bit of the words connected together. But as soon as those segments are a little bit larger than a single transition between two phonemes, the quality became higher and higher. And so you, you realize that. So, so the, yeah. The, the actual uh, voice files are recorded by humans. Yeah. In any case, in the TTS today, you have a human speaker that is recorded. The point is, what do you record? For the diphone, you record all the phoneme of the language, at, uh, uh, all the transition between phonemes of the language. So the corpus is smaller. Usually is a set of sentences. The speaker read the sentences. And the company, like Loquendo, do the lab labeling and so on on those sentences. Labeling label is done manually. It's done automatically. Automatic. Yes, you run an ASR on the sentences that already knows what is spoken. Ah. And you need to, spoke, to, to mark where the phonemes are. Usually, this is not perfect. Then you discover that some mark is not well placed, and manually you move that. Because sometimes, instead of Roma, you listen Rona, because something of m is missing, and so the sound is different. And so you have a tweaking at the end. The unit selection, you do another thing. You say, well, the Italian. I need to cover all the phonemes, but also the most frequent sentences and word and so on. So you do a larger work. So the speaker, instead of speaking half a day, is speaking two or three days. We are speaking of number of hours, eight, nine number of hours, are the hours needed for doing a unit selection TTS. Not, 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 not because you have the connection. Otherwise, it would become not eight hours, but uh, 10 for 100 or a million. Well. If you do that, you will have a very, very, very big voice. There is a tricky behind that, because in the former TTS, you can tweak parameters. So it was easy for IBM to make the voice singing. Uh, in the unit selection, you are more related what you recorded. So either you recorded in that, for instance, for expressing emotion, you in principle should record the speaker saying sentences in different emotional states that is very difficult. Or what we are trying to do, you need to do signal processing techniques in order to be able to change. But as soon as you start to change, the quality drops of a very high degree, the voice return robotic, and so is. This is the challenge today, to have natural and flexible. Before it was flexible, but was robotic. So I will skip most of the rest, because we already said 
So you do something when you prepare the database for unit selection, and then when you have a sentence, you do a, a matching inside uh, the database, and then you do the, co the concatenation of the pieces and some signal processing things there because you need to tweak the junction point, otherwise you listen something weird. I will have you listen something from our TTS. Hello and welcome. Excuse me? Can I help you? May I have your attention, please? Oh, come on. That's no way to talk to a girl. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. So in this case... Hmm. Uh, ah. Good grief. I cannot Speak. stop Speak. Okay, I do this. In this case, what we did was for give more expression to the voices, we started to do something very simple, that is to record some set of sentences emotionally marked. And so you have them in the database, so you can select those very marked questions, greetings, and so on. This is obviously not the, to have an expressive voice, but is to give more expression on some of the sentence that you can realize. Something that we are doing is to try to customize the voice. If you have a single voice, you can generate other one. Hello, I'm Susan, Laquendo's American voice, and here's Abby, my daughter. Hello, I'm Abby, and my voice is generated based on Susan's voice using the new timber functionality. And I can also use deeper timber and deeper and deeper and so deeper. So we have a timber. You can change that. Something, sometimes the voice you generate are nice and you can use them. In many cases, they are stupid or silly. But there are applications also for silly voice, for instance, gaming and so on. So it's a good feature to have in order to, the, to change. Another thing we did was try to synchronize the voice that is speaking with other audio, for instance, music like here. Are you searching for speech and music? Let's listen to Amadeus Mozart. Today, Loquendo TTS offers a new feature. Using simple command tags embedded in the text, users can now reproduce audio files and music so synchronized with the words of the simple speech. So the point here is that you are mixing the music and okay. the voice and synchronizing them. Okay, let's change there. audio file So now. you can fade the music, write no the music, don't change, do command those things. Command such mix, play, as well stop, as you are doing pause and resume. Allow users to have complete control on the audio sources. That. Are you doing anything tomorrow? Would be great to see you. Another I'll be at pub before 8. Ring later. If Bye for now. Hugs and kisses, Susan. If you have text messages like those that are written in a strange language, the point is how to render that. You, in that case, need a lexicon that is able to grasp what are the words that need to be spoken. So for the expressive TTS, what we did was try to find category like announcement, apologizes, compliment, disapproval, and for all of them, for all the language, find sentences that the, you, the people usually say and record them with different degree of markedness to have them stronger and stronger. So when you are creating a text, you can select those. Another interesting area is mixed language. We are in a moment where there are many, many cases where you need to mix different languages. The first approach was you change the voice. You have a voice for Italian. When you switch to English, you change the voice and find an English speaker. That is very unpleasant in the same sentence to listen to voice alternating. Listen here, an example. Many movies have been produced and filmed in Mexico, even though in many instances you would never know it. We can quote, for example, y tu mamá también. or La Última Noche. that are examples of films shot in Mexico. You see that now it's changing, so in many applications it's not good because you will change many voices, it's bad. Another way is to find a bilingual speaker, but it's easy to find perhaps a bilingual, even if not so easy if you need to be a professional for doing recordings. But if you have three, four, five, you need to find a five lingual speaker. It's almost impossible. So we are trying to do an attempt to 
find a way to solve in that. The result today is is these. Many movies have been produced and filmed in Mexico, even though in many instances you would never know it. We can quote, for example, Itu Mama Tambien, or La Ultima Noche, that are examples of films shot in Mexico. So what we are doing is there is a guesser that looks at the text and try to identify if there are pieces in another language. If he find a piece in another language, selects the language pack of the other language and transcribe that using the knowledge of the other language. Then there is a mapping between the phonemes of uh, the target language and the one of the voice that is speaking. So in that there are interpolation and the result is not perfect, it's a bit funny, but there are many applications that is useful because if you are an English native speaker, it's better to speak you in a little bit English Italian, a little bit English French, a little bit English German, that perfect because may, it might be that you cannot understand it very well and it's difficult for you to recognize. This technique is heavily used in the uh, personal navigation devices where you are in a foreign country, but you are, I'm an Italian speaker, I go in German. I need to have the German figure right in a way that I can understand, for instance, the streets, the cities. This is an example. Hello, Madame Francis Dupa, may I help you? This is English English, it's saying Francis. So this is the English translation. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the translation of English with the French in the middle that is interpolating with the English sounds and the, and the, and the result is this, like this. Hello, Madame Francois Dupont. May I help you? So he's trying to say, Francois Dupont, how the voice is able to do that. Here are other funny examples. This is an Italian speaking German. So if you go in uh, close to Germany, all the Italian people there are speaking this way because they are bilingual and they speak most French. This is me. Hello, I am Luca and I am eloquendo synthetic voice. I can read in English as well. Don't you believe me? Well, still with my Italian accent. My name is Juliette. This is my first time in California. Hello, I'm Jorge. This is my first time in San Francisco. Hola a todos. Hablo español porque en vacaciones fui a Mallorca. Una es la muy bonita. Okay. So that is the best that we have done today. So there are many interesting areas of evolution of the TTS. One is the prosodic contour, so to change the expressivity of the voice. Another interesting area is the voice morphing. Would be very nice to have a TTS, then you tweak a little bit and you obtain your voice or the voice of another person, of an actor or whatever you need. So to have something then to morph it in order to obtain the characteristic of another voice. So there are attempts, there are also some results, but still far away from. Then there are many other interesting areas. I will switch to ASR because the time is, the time is running very fast. In the ASR, the, the, the thing is on the other side. We have the voice, we need to extract some parameters from the voice, this is done by a front end. Then there is a kind of a search that try to match inside some knowledge what is the best realization of that parameters that you received in the input. And the best one is the result of the ASR that usually is a sequence of word, where on top you can apply other things for transform the word in a meaning. For instance, a date from the way you say in the date result. This is from a statistical point of view. What do you do? You have an acoustic signal with samples and you want to recognize word. So if, if you apply <coughs> You want the, con uh, the sequence that maximizes the sequence of words given the acoustic input. Using the bias rule, you can revert that and try to find the, the best sequence of words that gives that realization times the probability of the sequence of words. Those are the two pieces of probability that you try to model inside the ASR. 
the first thing the likelihood is done by the acoustic model and the second part is done by the language model is a probability of the that sequence is probable in, in the language that you are you are considering the result today are very high in controlled and also natural environment speaker independent especially if the vocabulary is not huge if the vocabulary is huge or the people is speaking in a very very natural and spontaneous way there are still problems to be solved and the performance is drops <clears throat> This is how is done our ASR that is a bit not very typical because it's an hybrid neural network and HMM ASR. We are using neural networks for doing the front end. So we have the acoustic signal is transformed in sepstral uh, uh, parameters. Those are given to a neural network with feedback inside. And this is able to generate all the emission probability for all the unit that you have defined for your, your language. So in a single step, you obtain all the probability that can be needed. And this is, if you do that in efficient way, can save a lot of com computation afterward during the search. For modeling the words, we are using what all the people use today that are HMM. But we found that instead of today, many of the ESR system are using continuous density HMM with triphones. So they try to uh, use larger and larger units if the training corpus is large enough to train in a proper way those. We are doing a little bit of different things. We are using stationary transition units. All the units are done like the one that you see. The first is a transition, the second one is a sound, and the other one is the transition from this sound to another one. For instance, for the Italian, we have uh, 400 different units only. Other systems have more and more. So our way of doing the things is to save computational time they obtain very reasonable, very high, we think, result. So we are able to easily create new languages and recognize them. <clears throat> the performance are on small vocabulary 99%, like digits. On medium size, you drop to 95. If you arrive to 10,000 or 100,000 words, you obtain 85, 90%. Those are state-of-the-art result that you can obtain. So we have a little strange way of doing ASR that is giving us very good result in all the language that we tested it. <clears throat> a thing that can be easily seen is that the technology can learn on the task. This is a chart of, of the NIST and IST uh, benchmark did in the past is a public chart. You see that if the time moves on each database, you obtain better and better and better result. Because actually you are learning from the task that you are doing. The most difficult one are like the red one switchboard over there. These are those where you have very spontaneous speech and that is difficult still to obtain one, less than 10% uh, error rate. But for instance, from broadcast news that is very well pronounced speech, uh, even on vocabulary of 65K words, you can obtain close to 90% of error rate. <clears throat> I need to speed up a lot. I will just give you an idea of, well, actually, when you use the ASR, you need to give some knowledge of what you want to recognize. Today, there isn't a magic ASR that without knowledge is able to recognize. That would be a phonetic recognizer that recognizes only the phonemes. 
but today the result of the phonetic recognizers are very low, so it's very errorful because phonemes are very similar. You need to give a knowledge, and usually the knowledge is given either in grammars, that means I model exactly the language that I want to recognize. All the way the user, the speaker will say is in the grammar. And that are the most effective one because they have a lot of constraint. If the user speak in the grammar, you obtain good result. The problem is if, if the user says something different, you cannot recognize or you misrecognize, you recognize something for. The other way that certainly is used in search in many large vocabulary things is to use statistical language models. That means to model probability of sequence of words. The problem of the statistic language model is that you need to train those probabilities in the context that you will use. So the big limitation is that if I'm doing banking, I need to have a system and start to acquire material on banking, on interaction, in order to tune. So it takes months to tune a language model, unless you have magically all those, all that corpus already done somewhere. We did something on something that stays in the middle, that is to have a single node that is called garbage, that you can put in a grammar, that is able to recognize everything is not in the grammar, everything else. So you, if you have constrained grammar, you should model only the content part that you are interested in, and then use the garbage to take everything else. Obviously, what is taken by the garbage is, disappears because you will not know what is said. But the important is that what you are interested in, in the example is from Rome to Venice or that kind of sentences is recognized. You, you see that you, the user can say million and million of different way of saying the same things. So the garbage is, should be able to capture that. Um, this is an example of the SRGS grammar where this is the content part from city to city and the city in the example is Rome, Venice. And those are the garbage rules that are optional, repeat from zero to one garbage. So this grammar is able to recognize millions of different sentences with from Venice to Rome in the middle. So it's a way of saving time. Uh, in this grammar, there is also the generation of the result, and this is the example of the result obtained in one of those sentences. We did that test in different model. One was to find a general model for the language, and another one is to use fillers. You can say, okay, those words are not pertinent to the content. So I use them as fillers in a loop for catching everything else. Actually, the better result was obtained in Loquendo using a phonetic models, using our unit, our, in order to catch. And that gave us very good uh, result. We lose very little. Uh, so the probability of losing uh, the accuracy that we can obtain is more or less the same. And so is, is what we have inside the, the product. <clears throat> Even in ASR, there are many odd issues. One of the issues is we still need to treat properly the signal that arrives from voice over IP, from mobile or other different networks uh, to subtract the noise. If it's noisy, we lose uh, a lot in the performances. So perhaps you have a very good recognizer in quiet environment, then you are in a car or you are in a pub or you are uh, in a street or you are in a railway station and you obtain a poorer result. And the other problem is continue to work to model the out of vocabulary words and so on. So today we don't see that there is a new good idea, even in the research, to change the framework of ASR. Needs someone that discovers something because the HMM are doing very well. They can be extended. So the work is on the edges to treat those difficult pieces in a little better way in order to obtain a little better performance that makes the ASR usable 
in all the context. I think I need to skip the, well, I give just a few on speaker verification, then we move ahead on the next step. In speaker verification, the point is that either to identify, to verify that the person is the one that claimed to be, so to use it as a password, I say, I'm Paolo, then I speak, and from the voice, he say, okay, you are really Paolo, you are not another person. Or identification, that means I have many ideas of different people, I want to know if the one that arrives is one of those, those that is used, for instance, if you have many people, for instance, in Google, to know if you are you or him or another person, even if you do not claim that. Everything is based on the creation of a voice print. That is a biometric identification of your voice. In this case, this is different from ASR because what is important are the unique characteristics of your voice. Each vocal tract is different. The way you pronounce is different from people to people. So the voice print should capture the unique things that the single person has and then compare them for the verification. Okay, I will jump ahead at this point. Mm. Are there any questions? Otherwise, I will jump in the more standard and architectural part of the presentation. I put in the presentation also some reading. If people are interested to go a little bit in deep also, there are some. <clears throat> I need to move in this part. <clears throat> Raman and me were working in the W3C. I think in the year around the born of Google and how, there was a big transformation of the way of using the speech technology because the standard body did a good work in order to create a standard for simplifying the creation of application. The war started near 2000, and the first results were obtained and stable in 2004, another in 2007, and few other will come. This did this. In 2000, Jim Larson, that was the chairman, drew this picture. It's not a real system. It's modules that can be ASR, language understanding, dialogue, generation, TTS. And what he did was, to draw all those possible standards that can be created to help to do that work. This is the same picture today. The standard in red are recommendations, so they are finished. There might be a new release, but that release is done. The work is done. And other two or three are the one in blue, like this, the call control, Emma, are close to be finished. So we realized what was <laughs> thought in 2000. You can have all those modules completely standard. They don't care if you use my technology, your technology, another technology. And also for the developer of the service, you can create an application, and then you will apply it to different platform. That was very, very different before that, where you had to be tied to a single vendor. If you are doing ASR with one, you had to develop the thing for him, use his platform, and so on. So it was very expensive. And then if you move to another one, you throw everything away. The standard made the web possible in the field of speech applications. So you do the speech application on the web, because all those are XML languages you can produce and have in a web application wherever you want. Then the platform is a browser specialized to those languages, but a browser that does HTTP get uh, and then return a result and is able to communicate. And the goal of the platform is to control the ASR and the TTS. This is a voice XML platform. <clears throat> so the, the key point where it took seriously the web paradigm in the field of speech he did a powerful abstraction to write a voice XML application is easy. Also to write grammar is easy. Maybe it's tedious to write grammars, but it's not difficult. And the voice XML delegates to many other standards 
to do specific work for the ASR, there are SRGS and SISR, SSML for the TTS, and so on. For the ASR, what is doing is that you have two format. One is textual, that is called ABNF, and the other one is XML-based. And you can create grammar for both voice recognition and DTMF. If you follow the link, you find the spec. On top of the grammar, you can add SISR. That means to add the semantic part of the grammar in order to build the result. This is an, an example of a simple grammar that is recognizing only Turing in all four possible combinations, the textual ones, the XML, and on the row, ASR literal only for doing simple transliteration if you have a noun and you want to return another one, or the script one, you have ECMAScript, JavaScript, so you can do whatever you want on the result of the ASR in order to building a rich result. There are still unsolved issues. One is to finish the word on the lexicon, and I'm the author of that specification, so it's a word for me also. And another one is on the language modeling. Today, there is not a standard. That, for the future, might be an interesting area to work. To have a standard for language modeling that neatly interoperates with the SRGS grammar and perhaps has all the SISR capability of producing also in the language modeling domain of dictation and so on, a rich results. <clears throat> For the TTS, if the TTS does all those activities, usually the TTS try to do the best thing that he can. So you don't need to do nothing. You give the text and the TTS is reading. But in the case, it's not reading properly. You need to tweak something. You want to change the volume or the voice or something else. The SSML is able to give you few elements that you can add in order to say, in this, in this place, change the voice, raise the pitch, lower the volume, and so on. This is an example of a very simple uh, document where you have a few elements for giving structure, like paragraph and sentence, and so on. I will skip the rest. Yeah, I give you a small idea. What is the work on TTS today? The main is international. W3C found that the Chinese people found that the SSML was not usable very well because it's a tonal language, and there was not a control of the tones. And secondly, they do not have the white space among the codes, so uh, something needs to be reworked in another way. <clears throat> uh, W3C took this seriously and did a set of workshops trying to capture not only the Chinese, but also the Indian and other European and also uh, Semitic languages, if they need something different. And what was captured by those workshops is the work that is done in SSML 1.1. That will be very similar to 1.0, but better cover the international languages like Chinese, one of them, but also Japanese, Japanese and many other. <clears throat> this will not be a new generation of SSML. That will be waited for the next version. I'm working on the pronunciation lexicon. I would very like that the work that we did to create this format for lexicon would be taken seriously. And in future, you can find easily resources in PLS. Because to pronounce something is specific. So we can find many, many textual resources. But resources on pronunciation are not very easy to find. And this is a simple format. I skip this, where few elements, I give you an example like this. You have a lexicon. The lexicon is done by lexemes. X lexemes can have one or more grapheme. That is how you write the things. And then you can have either phoneme or alias or both. That alias is a transliteration, for instance, for the acronyms W3C, World Wide Web, to have the way of pronounce that acronym. 
And while the phoneme is, if you need to go to the phonetic representation, <clears throat> then in here I have many examples. OK, there is a question. Yeah, you are right. There is a problem there. What PLS 1.0 offers, maybe is not the complete solution, but is an attempt, is um, you can add in the phoneme, I do not have the example, I'm sorry, here, an attribute that say role something, a URL. So you give a URL to a phoneme. So you can have the same acronym many, many times, but all of them is characterized in some way. The URL should be a nice space that helps you to know where you can use or not that and to make unique that entry. So that is the way that we propose to solve the problem of homograph, that is the one that you were saying. Two words spelled exactly the same way, but pronounced in a different way. Then there are other cases interesting. For instance, for ASR, if you are in the United States, many words are pronounced in a different way from different people of different region of the United States or pe people native of different languages. So if you want to properly recognize, you need to give those variations that the same words can be pronounced in this way, but also in that way, also in that way. If you don't give that, the ASR will do some errors, will not be good. So it would be very, very nice to find in the time resources that helps the people that want to do a system in an easiest way because you can find the tweaks already done by other people and put on the web. About the pronunciation, that is a point because uh, the phonetician are working on IPA that is all in that chart since the beginning of the, la the past century. So it's a very old but very effective way of dealing with all the possible languages. All the languages from Africa, China, and so on are using those set of phonemes. But the problem is that there are glyphs that are a little bit strange. They are Unicode, so you can write that. Would be nice to find tools open source that helps the people to use that language because unless you are a trained phonetician, it's very difficult to create, to customize the pronunciation of a sentence of, of a word. Uh, some people propose to have languages more based on uh, um, standard ASCII called Sampa, but in any case are weird, the translation, so I don't know. Perhaps this is the more standard one. So it would be nice to have lexicon with this phonetic language and tools that helps the people to do that. I think I can skip most of the voice XML. The voice XML is the dialogue, so it's done of prompts and grammars. Those blocks are called uh, dialogues <laughs> and are forms. And usually in voice XML, you can do either. Yeah, OK. Sorry? Yeah, five minutes or 10, OK. Sorry? OK. OK, I will skip the rest to jump to the conclusion. I have minus five minutes. You can find the rest in the presentation, so in case you can see something more. Future. Well, on the technology, I don't see many, many things that are happening at the moment. If not, to work on the edges, on the difficult tasks that are difficult things, but useful for using them. On the user interface, there are a couple of trends that are taking place today. Roberto Pieraccini uh, said that we are at the third generation of speech application of dialogues. 
The first one was the one of four or five years ago where the interaction is very guided by the system, usually for giving information. And the grammar are very constrained, and the dialogue is simple. Then the second generation is today, where you have more complex transactional services where you can buy and sell things and so on, where you have 100 dialogue modules. Is advocating another generation that has 10,000 or 100,000 dialogue modules. And in his example, he's giving the kind of troubleshooting where you have a problem with a hardware. You try to explain it, and an automatic system is helping you to solve, to do the test, and so on. But another variation of vocal user interface is conversational interfaces. The one I said with the garbage before, where you recognize only partially the things, but the point is to have a very, very good vocal user interface that keep the, guy, the dialogue going. So the interaction are more, more, more simplified than the one of the first generation of the dialogue. Another point is that the speech can be and will be pervasive everywhere from the car, from the station. Already today, if you in Italy go on a train in a railway station, there is the TTS. On the train, there is the TTFs. If you call a number, you have a dialogue system. If you call a taxi, you have a So you can have dialogue application and speech everywhere. And the other point is to move toward more distributed application. In this, the W3C is doing a few things. One is developing state chart XML for modeling and interaction. It's an event-based language with a very, very solid semantic is also part of UML, but is XML. And that can be the interaction manager, the one that controls the things. This is an example where you have a parallel state chart. So you can do this and this at the same time. For instance, controlling a GUI and the voice at the same time. So you can have the SCXML that is doing the interaction. And then modalities, different modality. One is the visual one, the one that you see. Another one is the vocal one. Another one can be gesture, haptic, and many other modality you can have them. And the state chart is controlling all of them. So the role of voice XML becomes less monolithic of a full application. But small pieces of dialogue that are called when you need them from the state chart on top of that. Also, from an architectural point of view, there is a problem where you put those SCXML. And you can think to have rich devices with the interaction on that. So the device, the browser, will download the SCXML and run it there. Or if you are using mobile phones or very small devices, you can use the modality from here that using IP interact with a browser that is distributed in the network and is, do, is controlling the interaction in order to realize the application. In this, the voice XML free, do, free 0.0 will be the language to be used in that context, because less modular, you will profile it, you will customize it in a better way. So this is something new that is being done in W3C. And this is the end of my talk. If there are further questions, I will appreciate or. I will give to you. And you will put where you want. I have all, also all the audio historical ones, so you can put them too there. So. This would be really good material to have linked off the videos. I do yeah. that. Yeah, I will give you the presentation. I have also a couple of other presentations more didactic on SRGS, SSML. I will give to you, put there, and the people if want to have something can. There is a question, OK? I saw the evolution of voice making XML. I see that high level API for grammar. But I wonder if there is another API for uh, lower level of programming with speech technologies, 
such as A is Okay, he's asking me if the voice, being that the voice XML is a higher level API, if there are lower level APIs. Well, today the best you have is what has done in the IETF uh, that create the MRCP protocol that is media control resource protocol version two. That is a protocol, it's not an API. So you need to create a client, but there are open source client for MRCP. So those are the low level, but scalable for big application. So you have the API, but usually the API are meant if you are controlling your single instance of the ASR and DTS. So are for PC application on your own PC, you have some standard API. There are the Java speech API and the Microsoft SAP APIs. Thank you.